Council. Please welcome this evening's guests. As the president of Minnehaha Falls Landscape and Giving Tree Gardens and the founder of Be Safe Minneapolis, Russ Henry has been protecting and growing ecosystems across Minnesota for decades. Together, his landscaping and garden companies install, manage, and restore hundreds of properties throughout the Twin Cities with native pollinator plants and without the use of pesticides or synthetic fertilizers. Chesney Enquist is the general manager of Giving Tree Gardens and Minnehaha Falls Landscaping and co-founder of the local advocacy group, Be Safe Minneapolis. Chesney enjoys practicing low impact gardening techniques and raising awareness about the importance of supporting pollinators and maintaining healthy, resilient ecosystems. Take it away, Russ and Chesney. Well, thank you so much, Emma. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here tonight with the State Horticultural Society and uh, talking about backyard food forests. So uh, yes, I'm Russ Henry and I am the president and owner of Minnehaha Falls Landscaping. We are an all organic landscaping company and uh, we have a very informative website that I encourage a lot of folks to visit, minnehahafallslandscape.com. Uh, we've got a blog there with a food forest uh, blog post uh, in addition to blog posts about such fun topics as bee lawns and rain gardens, uh, resilient, low maintenance landscaping, all kinds of fun topics on there. Well, tonight we're gonna be talking about backyard food forests. And I am sitting in our backyard food forest to bring this presentation to you. So at the end of the presentation, we're gonna have a tour, a virtual tour. I'll take you around with the camera and show you some of my favorite backyard food forest plants. I'm sure you can see behind me the magnificent choke cherry. That was the first backyard food forest plant to go in here in our home yard. And uh, it's grown abundantly since we put it in. We'll cover choke cherries and all sorts of uh, excellent parts of the food forest. Now, first we're gonna talk about the seven steps for remaking, for getting to a food forest, for rebuilding, regrowing health in our landscapes and regrowing a food forest. And then we're going to talk about the eight layers of the food forest. So multiple layers of edible and uh, native plants that can um, feed people and wildlife. So, but before we get into that, let's start by talking about what is a food forest? So a food forest is simply a landscape that's filled with plants and fungi that produce food for insects, wild animals, and humans. These are the landscapes where the greatest diversity of earthlings can thrive. Earthlings, we're all earthlings here. So the robins and the puppy dogs and the inchworms and the people and the turtles and uh, the penguins and everybody, we're all earthlings and we share this planet. Sometimes we think about earthlings and we think, well, that's humans, but actually it's all of the living creatures on earth and we're all in a community. We need each other to survive. And it used to be the case that food forests were actually uh, one of the normal uh, standard ways to manage land uh, on the planet. And so um, here in Minnesota, uh, buffalo and fire were used by Native American people uh, to control the land, uh, to manage ecosystem succession and keep uh, portions of the ecosystem in productivity that benefited the people who were managing for that succession. Uh, we can see in the bottom right hand corner here, this is a picture of a Hawaiian food forest and uh, the, the people, the Polynesian people of Hawaii uh, grew some of the most magnificent food forests on the planet uh, and had uh, basically the entire Hawaiian islands were all food forested. Uh, and Minnesota has a great history of food forests and uh, continues uh, to be a place where food forests can be grown and, uh, and, and can really serve to expand and uh, protect the ecosystem. What we're talking about here is managed ecosystem succession. So in a food forest, we're trying to grow a set of plants that produce food for us or, and or for the wildlife. And typically we're using a lot of native plants and some non-native food producing plants in that. When we're talking about ecosystem succession, this is an important thing for all of us growers to keep in mind. 
because just as we have a ecosystem succession that we recognize above ground going from bare rocks into weeds and grasses and into shrubby lands and then eventually into climax forest uh, below ground we have a similar succession happening and so in the beginning where we have bare rocks there's almost no fungi and there's just a little bit of bacteria in this soil as we move along through succession we gain more bacteria and more fungi in the soil till eventually we get into the kind of middle succession stages around where prairies grow and that's where we have a balance of about half and half fungi and bacteria in terms of biomass in the soil as we move along and the plants get more woody in ecosystem succession underground the soil is grows more fungal so that the ratio flips and we get a more fungal fungally dominant soil than bacterially dominant now this is important because we're trying to grow all sorts of different plants in the food food forest and we need to know are we trying to grow plants that require a lot of fungi in the soil and therefore we need to feed that fungi in order to grow those plants or are we trying to grow plants that require a bacterially dominated soil and so as we move along through our seven steps of reforesting regrowing the food forest what we're going to see is that we're actually going to be growing more fungi and more bacteria but we're going to grow uh, the ratio of fungi greater at, over time as we move through ecosystem succession. So what we're talking about here again, managed ecosystem, ecosystem succession, which creates ongoing stability. When ecosystems are managed to stay in a certain uh, place in succession, be that prairie or shrubland or, wood, or, or woods or climax forest, uh, what we create is stability. And through stability, the systems, the living systems on the planet are able to maximize biodiversity. So we're talking about the uh, maximization of biodiversity through the creation of stability by managing ecosystem succession in our own yards. Let's see here. Okay, so now what we've entered here is what needs to be called and thought of as the Anthropocene. And uh, the Anthropocene is a uh, age of man, uh, or excuse me, an age, uh, a geological epoch uh, that is noted by um, human interference in the environment. So we are the major force of nature uh, currently. And so now we call this age in, the, in, in terms of geological ages. And so we're talking long stretches of, of history, um, this new age is called the Anthropocene. And essentially it is called the Anthropocene due to the massive amount of destruction that human beings are causing in the environment. This, uh, this our destruction that we're creating will forever be noted in the geological record. So we can't really ever escape our, um, the impacts of our lifestyle. And so some of those impacts, so what, have, what does the Anthropocene really look like? Uh, we have to think about the difference between the way that Native American people manage land, uh, excuse me, Native people manage land throughout the entire world and, uh, and the way that we're managing land in our current culture. And uh, we are not managing land for long-term results. Uh, we are managing land uh, for short-term gain. And, um, and it's... The, the problems therein are quite obvious. We are creating massive pollution. Uh, we are in the middle of, uh, we, we just actually measured 420 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is the highest measurement um, ever recorded. And uh, so we are in a man-made age of uh, ecological terror, as it, uh, I guess we could say. Uh, so that's not a very fun thing to think about, uh, we're doing this to ourselves and we're doing it at home. And so this is what all that destruction kind of looks like in our home landscape. We're blowing leaves, we're mowing, we're using a lot of herbicides and insecticides, and we're, we're putting little signs that say that the kids and the pets have to stay off the lawns. I mean, why, are we, why do we have lawns if kids and pets have to stay off them? This becomes my question. If you think about this, we are essentially managing through death. We're managing through murder. So when we run a lawnmower over the lawn, we're killing off all the dandelion flowers. We're knocking the, the grass down to two or three inches so that the root systems are very shallow uh, and that basically only grass can thrive. 
I, you know, think about it when you're running the lawnmower over the lawn, you're running over the bodies, the living body, the once living bodies of bees and butterflies, moths, um, all sorts of important insects are getting just chopped up and destroyed in lawnmowers on a weekly basis. The leaf blowers, we're, we're using leaf blowers, we're taking all the leaves off of the land and we're shipping them off to the compost facility. In the, in, and in the meantime, we're causing uh, invasive species like jumping worms and buckthorn to be spread all around. And we're taking all of the leaves that the moths and butterflies are laying their eggs in, and we're taking those and we're destroying them, putting them in the compost pile and whatnot, so the moths and butterflies are not able to come up uh, and emerge out of those dead leaves every year. So these are some things we should think about for our home landscape. These strategies are essentially the maintenance of colonization. We colonized, our ancestors colonized the land. They created, uh, uh, they, they, they killed the Native American people, uh, genocide, uh, killed the buffalo, um, uh, restricted fire, uh, filled in all of the, uh, I mean, Minneapolis and St. Paul were entirely wetlands at one point, and we filled all of that in to create uh, neighborhoods and golf courses. And uh, and so, you know, this is, this is part of our leg. Here we are, and we are still to this day, we think it is quite normal to get out a noisy machine that's used gas everywhere, and cut the entire environment down to two inches, and uh, spray it all with poison and call it a day. That's kind of a normal part of our landscape routine. And, and here we see what are actually the four major forces of destruction in Minnesota. So we like to talk about invasive species and we like to look at the margins of the land and say, over here in this little spot of land that we have allowed to be free, now there's buckthorn in it. And gosh, that buckthorn is invasive and we don't like it. But we are refusing to point that finger at ourselves and recognize that corn, soy, lawn and pavement are essentially the four horsemen of the apocalypse. They are what we are replacing wholesale, native, uh, productive, healthy environments with these either single species ecosystems uh, that can, they're not ecosystems, they're single species monocrops that can support only one creature and that's humanity. And it doesn't support us very well. Um, and, and or uh, these road, you know, these paved environments that are uh, just unable to support any life at all. Um, and we find some use for them. So we put them everywhere we want. Um, these are uh, these are dead landscapes. These are non non living landscapes and anything that we do to reduce corn, soy, lawn and pavement in Minnesota is a move back towards health. It's a move back towards ecosystem. It's a move towards stability in our ecosystems and therefore towards biodiversity. These are the least biodiverse and the most common lands, landscapes in Minnesota. Okay, what we are creating with all of this trouble here uh, is the sixth mass extinction. So we are creating an environment in which Nobody can find a purchase. There's no food. There's no uh, there's no habitat, and we're killing off the animals, the the other Earthlings on this planet that we share the planet with at an amazing, astounding, and and deeply frightening rate. Please look uh, at the background rate of extinction down on the bottom of the dotted line, and then see around the Industrial Revolution what happened with the rate of extinction and how it has skyrocketed and shows no signs of abating. The work that we do in our backyards can actually be heroes' work. We could actually preserve the genetic heritage of this planet in our own backyards by creating space for the wild animals and for ourselves to find a snack. We instead we've got these landscapes that make us all hangry, a little anger, a little anger induced by the lack of food, and that's what's going on with all of the wild animals out there. And instead, it's time for us to start growing a food forest, a uh, landscape that feeds people, that feeds wildlife, uh, that gives and continues to give and continues to change and evolve and grow over time. So let's get into the seven steps of food forest ecosystem succession. When we're thinking about our landscapes and with this, this landscape that I'm sitting in here, it was a blank slate when I moved in. It was just all on grass. And so uh, I went through a number of steps in order to, over the last 15 years, in order to uh, 
to grow a food forest here at home. And um, so I've laid those steps out uh, for my clients and for, for us today here in order for everybody to understand that we can take little steps towards remaking, regrowing a food forest. And that a little bit at a time is actually the preferred way to get there. It's the best way to get there because we need to grow that soil health along the way towards our, uh, our ultimate food forest goals. Um, we, we don't want to just take our blank canvas of a lawn and start plugging in our, our late system succession plants because we haven't done anything to the soils to get them there. Those plants will, if we grow the soils along the way, the plants will be stronger, more resilient, the systems will be healthier and will grow and last longer. And again, we're looking for stability over the long term in order to maximize biodiversity so that stability can come uh, spur along by our efforts if we take time to go through a multi-step process of regrowing the food forest. So here we go. Let's, let's have a look at these seven steps. We've got number one, go organic. Number two is our bee lawns. We've got our pollinator pocket gardens. Number three. Fourth, we're going we're gonna to start harvesting vegetables and then we get into meadow restorations, food forests, and hey, we're going to take it a step further and we're going to fall in love with the forest. We're going to grow a love forest in this presentation. So after we talk about the seven steps, we're going to get into the eight layers. Those layers of a food forest consist first and foremost, starting in the ground with two layers, the mycelial and the root layer. Then we're going to get above ground with the ground covers growing into the herbaceous layer, vines that take up all sorts of wonderful open spaces in the food forest, shrubs, understory and overstory. We're going to get into all of that. So let's jump in to the seven steps of backyard ecosystem succession. Okay, so number one, go organic. Okay, so this this uh, first step is uh, does I believe in, in in my estimation need to be taken first, and um, all of the other steps can kind of be added a little at a time. You can go back and forth after step one, and maybe add a little step four and a little step two and a little step five. But if you don't do step one first, your whole system is going to suffer. And so this is why I say we have to eliminate synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, all the isides, all the synthetics need to be eliminated because they throw the system out of balance and they make us reliant on synthetic products. We have to think about it. If we're going to reforest the planet, we need to reforest the places where we're getting our products from as well. And there, there are no factories in forests. Right, so uh, we are not going to get herbicides and synthetic fertilizers from a forest. We need to get our fertility products from the forest itself, from the land itself. And so that's why I say that going organic is the first step, eliminating synthetics and switching over to a soil health and compost regimen. Soil health and compost, soil health really looks like making sure the ground is covered at all times, whether that's with a temporary wood mulch cover or with a longer term living ground cover uh, one way or another, we need to make sure that the soil is covered at all times. And throughout all of your food foresting, no matter what stage you get to, no matter what layer you're thinking about, we are always going to be composting. So composting is the first step, and it happens at every other phase uh, also of food forest growth. So soil health and composting, they're going to stick with us throughout the entirety of our discussion here. They are the foundation of every important um, ecosystem of every healthy ecosystem, soil health and compost. On the website at minnehahafallslandscape.com, we have some tips on composting. I'm gonna give you my two, um, number one and number two tips for composting. These took me many years to learn, um, but I'm gonna give them to you in 30 seconds. So number one, we wanna make sure that our compost is always at about 50% moisture. And you can check on your moisture level by grabbing a handful of compost from kind of scoop, a top, scoop away the top of the pile, grab some from the middle, give it a handshake squeeze. If you're getting a drop of water coming off, then you're at about 50% moisture. If you're getting no water coming off of your hands when you give that oil or compost a handshake squeeze, then you need to add some water to your compost pile. And that's typically the case. I do 20 consultations a week, uh, four or five consultations a day where I'm invited into people's yards and I see all sorts of different uh, landscapes and compost uh, operations, uh, backyard compost operations. And what I can say is that most folks have basically a dry pile of sticks in the backyard and you wanna make sure that you got 50% moisture. The second, and uh, also this is the, just such a, 
that makes such a difference in your compost life. Red wiggler worms. You can see some red wiggler worms there in hands uh, in the picture. You can buy red wiggler worms online from um, uh, Jim's Worm Farm, which is a reputable operation, and they're not going to sell you jumping worms. Uh, you can also get them from Mother Earth Gardens here in Minneapolis. And uh, red wiggler worms will make it so you don't have to turn your compost pile. They're going to be taking the organic matter up and down and stirring the pile for you. And all the while, they're going to be bringing the microbes, the fungi and bacteria, to break down the organic matter in the compost pile. They're going to take that with them everywhere they go in the pile. Every spring, I go and inoculate our compost pile here at home with some red wiggler worms. And uh, by now, when you dig into the pile, they're all over the place in there. Uh, they really eat that pile down so that it uh, it moves fast through this through the season. Uh, but I do need to inoculate the pile every year because uh, the worms will die off in the winter. Uh, so when we eliminate synthetic, we're doing our baseline of pollinator protection, of water quality protection, of ecosystem protection, of human health protection, and this is where succession can begin. We are going to eliminate the entirety of succession if we continue to use synthetics. It just takes succession out of it. It scrambles everything about, about ecosystem succession so that you end up with uh, way more nutrient than you should have available so that we get runoff uh, nutrients and then you end up with soils that are very much devoid of life and um, nothing but bacteria in them, no nematodes or microarthropods or amoebae or fungi like we're supposed to have in healthy soils. So I always say step one is go organic and you can take the rest of the steps in any order you want, but step one is go organic and it's very important that we take step one first. Step two is the bee lawn. So this is what we did at home. Uh, we started infusing bee lawn seed mix into our gardens, uh, into our lawns uh, right away when we moved in. Um, we eliminated the pesticides and, fer and fertilizers that are being used here and we jumped right on in with some white clover, purple sulfiel. You can see that in the picture here. Uh, we had a creeping time. We let uh, fescue grass, we added fescue grass seed grow. We let the, the good time Charlie, AKA creeping Charlie grow in the lawn. That's a mint plant and it feeds many different bees. Um, and you know, dandelions, we let all kinds of weeds grow. We let the bee lawn occur. That brought in the pollinators, made it so that this space is a, pollinator, is a place where pollinators are trained uh, over many generations to start coming to. And so they go and they train the baby bees and the, the baby bees and the next generation will come come around here too. Um, and so this is the, that we call the bee lawn the second step because you've taken that first step of making things safe and now we're gonna make things habitable. We're gonna bring in the plants that will actually provide a small amount of habitat. These are low walkable plants, maybe get six or eight or 10 inches tall and uh, create a cover crop or a living mulch. This is where we learn to embrace weed because actually we're gonna find that many weeds are edible and a very important part of the food forest. Um, and uh, this is, again, this is early succession in, in terms of our ecosystem, managed ecosystem succession. This is very early succession where we're talking about the weed phase of succession, but it does allow us to grow deeper roots than a lawn would and so that starts to use up more use utilize more of the soil profile so that we have that to grow fungi in and to start to grow deeper roots for our next phase of succession which is of course the veggie harvest and the veggie harvest we call this one harvest uh, not just veggie phase because um, it's important for us to start thinking in terms of harvest the food forest is a place where we can get food we don't you know most of us don't necessarily like if we get hungry we don't think great I'm going to go in the backyard and get a meal but we could start thinking about that a little bit maybe great I'm going to go in the backyard and get a snack or I'm going to get something to add to the meal and so if we begin that harvest if we start harvesting that's going to put us on a pathway on a trajectory of thinking about the landscape as being the place that's going to provide us with sustenance and so uh, we begin harvesting from the yard we want to uh, the, all along the way, like I said, I do 20 consultations a weekend, all of a uh, 20 out of 20, everybody wants to hear about low maintenance strategies. Everybody wants to reduce maintenance. And um, I find that the high form of maintenance are actually uh, for landscapes are actually our lawns where we're having to go over them once a week. We're having to add fertilizers and uh, irrigation, uh, herbicides, all sorts of things in lawns. And so, um, 
Whereas basically, as you move along in uh, in the seven steps of succession, we get lower and lower maintenance all the time. A veggie garden can be a very low maintenance prospect where you are installing it. You may be using some clover as a cover crop and you're letting everything grow up and you're not having to do much weeding. But the work of it comes in the beginning and end of the season when you're installing the veggie garden and then when you're harvesting. Uh, with our veggies are, again, an early succession ecosystem. So a lot of the veggies we eat are actually weeds. Um, you know, think of all the brassicas, the cauliflower and cabbage and kale and broccoli. Those are all uh, essentially mustard greens, uh, different versions of mustard greens, and, and they are, uh, they're all um, weeds. They're part of weedy ecosystem, weedy ecosystem early succession. And uh, so when we're thinking about weeds in the soil, we know that they need a little bit of fungi, but they need a really bacterially dominant soil. This is why we have veggie harvest kind of early in our seven stages, our seven steps, because um, these, these plants will require those early stage succession soils. We, as we grow veggies, as we grow the bee lawn, we're going to be adding more organic matter to the soil all along. And through the addition of organic matter, we grow more fungi. That fungi then can support perennial plants, shrubs, and trees as we start to put those into the garden. When we get to stage four, we're really going to boost that pollinator presence with the use of native pollinator pot gardens. Now, these are gardens that a lot of us probably have on our lawns. We might have some of the mega monarch magnets in there, like Joe Pie weed and Meadow Blazing Star and Milkweed. Uh, you can see the echinacea in here and the, uh, and the prairie sage. Uh, the um, pollinator pocket gardens will really make sure that pollinators, a, a great diversity of pollinators, will start to utilize your space, be coming around throughout the entirety of the growing season. The pollinator pocket garden is going to bloom from early spring into late fall. And so it's going to be providing food for the pollinators to come around so that you are uh, you're sure that whenever you're putting an edible plant into your landscape, it's also going to be pollinated uh, because there's all, already pollinators that are going to be visiting your gardens all season long. Uh, pollinator pocket gardens are excellent for birds as well. They really help uh, bring in the birds. You get a lot of seeds and a lot of insects with the pollinator pocket gardens. Rain gardens are one of my favorite form of pollinator pocket gardens. And a uh, rain garden is simply a, a swale in the land um, that's dug out and planted with native plants that can take a seasonal inundation of water. We put these in uh, these type of rain gardens in low areas in the land or near a downspout so that we can absorb the rainwater. Uh, and that then not only is uh, helping pollinators and growing deeper roots, but through the addition of those deeper roots we are in, and putting the water into those spaces, we're filtering, cooling, and cleaning the rainwater before it gets over into our local waterways. We start to find in pollinator pocket gardens that there are significant edibles available. I'm backing up here a second, and of course, we know that the veggies harvest is highly edible, and that the bee lawn actually has some edibles in it. Um, the creeping thyme, the self-heal, the dandelions, the white clover, uh, the creeping charlie, all have edible qualities. So as we move through, we get more and more edible plants. Once we get to the pollinator pocket gardens, there are significant edible plants, and we're going to get into some of those uh, in our um, eight uh, uh, layers of the food forest here. As we're moving along through succession, after, we, after we've come into the pollinator pocket garden, it's time to expand that uh, effort and take over the whole yard with what we call the prairie meadow. And so uh, we're using prairie plants in a meadow-like setting, eliminating all of the grass in a lawn, uh, you can see in this image, this is from uh, Nokomis neighborhood, and we have uh, one of our gardens here where we've taken up all of the lawn in the whole yard. We replaced it with native plants that will uh, perform succession, that will change and grow over time. So you can see this is a very early stage of succession here. There's a lot of uh, grasses. Uh, you can see a lot of white clover, some early prairie sage, and some calamintha. Uh, the bees absolutely love this garden. Immediately upon installation, we had bees and monarch butterflies in the garden. And then this garden is planted with many different types of spreading native plants. 
we want to be thinking about how do we get multiple layers of spreading native plants into our landscapes because we want them to take over. A lot of folks in, on my, in the consultations that I do, they say, oh, this I don't like this fern or I don't like this grass or I don't like this plant over here because it's taking over. And I understand that sentiment. And yet I, I also understand that it's important that we have native plants take over our spaces um, and that we have multiple layers of those native plants working together to take over the spaces. That helps us keep the non-native invasive plants out of our landscapes by having multiple layers of strong native spreading plants. So spreaders are good. Um, with these prairie meadows, we get a high diversity of pollinators coming in. These are very low maintenance landscapes. Once you get into the prairie meadows uh, landscapes, your maintenance looks like going around and pulling a few weeds once a season, chopping down a couple of uh, tree seeds that try to sprout up. Um, not a lot of maintenance going on in these gardens. We get blooms all season. These are excellent bird and pollinator habitat. And here we start to see in these prairie meadow gardens, some minor predation. And predation should be one of the signs of a healthy ecosystem for us. When we have hawks or owls or foxes or cats, somebody coming into the ecosystem and eating a rabbit or a squirrel or a bird or a, or a toad uh, or a mouse, this is a good thing. Um, this is a very good thing because this is uh, mimicking the natural ecosystem, doing what should occur. Uh, sometimes we get a little bit freaked out about our birds eating cardinals and other, or excuse me, about our cats eating cardinals and other, other beautiful birds. But uh, um, and and you know that can be kind of avoided by keeping the cats. If you, if you have cats that go outside, you could make sure that they are inside for mostly for the day and outside at night. Um, and then they'll eat more mice and rabbits than they will birds. Um, but uh, again, it's better to have it's actually a really good sign to see some predation, even if it's house cats chomping on mice in the garden, because that is a natural cycle occurring. And of course, we, you know, just like people, cats got to have food too. And if their food is all coming from a factory, well, then that's divorced from the natural cycle. And so even having our pets participate in our landscapes is actually not that bad of an idea if we can control them from eating all of the birds. We don't want to let them do that. Uh, so minor predation occurs. That's a really good sign. And then these man these landscapes begin to manage all of the water, grow much deeper roots. Some of these prairie plants can grow 25, 30 foot deep roots. And we get to, we begin to get many edibles from our prairie meadow gardens. Now we get into the sixth stage and we can see this is a picture of our backyard food forest. We're looking down uh, from the second story window on the patio here. And we can see this is a a, a very filled space. I'm kind of sitting, um, if, if you look at the patio there, I'm sitting right now uh, against that big spot of green, uh, which is the choke cherry in the middle there, and um, uh, surrounded right now by native plants. Um, a food forest is going to have multiple layers of canopy of edible plants, uh, some edible for people, some not, but, uh, but, but then they will be edible for wildlife. Uh, we get a high diversity of pollinators. These are the lowest maintenance landscapes that we can grow. Um, almost no maintenance goes on in this landscape. Uh, I need to go around once a year with a pruner and cut down some weed trees. That's about it. Um, uh, we have blooms all season long from early spring until late fall. This is an excellent bird habitat. We have all of the migrating birds stop by. Um, uh, and then we have regular populations of cardinals and blue jays and robins, chickadees, nuthatches, um, and woodpeckers all frequent the lawn uh, to, to hang out and get food in the, in the food forest here. There are significant predation. We have hawks landing on the branches. Uh, we just watched a red tail take out a blue jay the other day. It was kind of amazing and, and frightening and, and kind of beautiful all at once. Um, significant predation occurs in these, and that's a very good thing. Uh, these spaces manage all of the water, 100% of the water that lands on the property. And we start to grow very deep roots with our food forests. And of course, we are getting many edibles for people out of our food forests. But we can take our landscapes one step further, and we can develop a landscape that is going to serve generations to come beyond ours, beyond our lifetime. And uh, these are what we call love forests. If we take uh, and put within our lawn some baby, some, some very young, say, uh, white pines or, bl or blue spruce, uh, 
uh, peak ecosystem succession plantings. And um, we install those into our food forests as babies and we allow them to grow up. You know, uh, here in this space, uh, at this landscape, we might own this house for another 20 years. And I have uh, six baby white pine trees throughout the garden, um, the tallest of which is about three feet right now, and the shortest are about six inches. And um, after the, the tw after about 20 years pass, those will definitely be the dominant uh, 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 plant life in the landscape here. And uh, that will be a gift to all of the birds and the wildlife that uh, can live on these, on these amazing um, peak ecosystem succession plantings uh, like white pines. White pines once covered the entirety of the state of Minnesota and uh, well, uh, of, the, of the northern half of the state of Minnesota. And uh, so much white pine tree was uh, cut down in Minnesota um, in, uh, in just a hundred year span um, that uh, we could, you could fill uh, train cars all the way to the moon and back with white pine boards um, just from Minnesota alone. We just, we wholesale destroyed all of that forest. And so it can be our legacy now to try to repair, to try to regrow and to reforest. And so uh, we, we always encourage folks to think about the long term after we're not using the landscape for food anymore. The, the ecosystem should be able to uh, find, find habitat and health and life in this landscape. And that's why we installed some baby white pines in our backyard food forest. One day they're going to grow up over the top of everything. And that's an excellent thing. Um, these forests, these love forests have the highest diversity of wildlife, the lowest maintenance possible. Uh, they bloom all season. They're excellent, excellent wildlife habitat. 100% of the rainwater gets clean that lands on them, uh, deepest roots possible, uh, significant edibles in these, and of course the highest predation possible. So love forests, food forests and love forests are where we are sharing more uh, of our landscape, uh, the, the maximum amount of our landscape possible with the wildlife. Okay, so let's jump in to the eight layers of food forest canopy. Now, uh, this is where plant nerds like me have a lot of fun because we're going to talk about some plant lists. Um, I do want to make a couple disclaimers in here. Uh, one, um, I'm going to be talking about edible edible plants. And every time I say a plant is edible, that does not mean that 100% of the plant from root to stem is edible. So anything I say is edible, you should get a feed guide such as uh, Sam Thayer's books. He has one called Forager's Harvest, which is a wonderful book for identifying the lookalike plants to the edibles so that you're not picking the wrong plant on accident. Um, I'm gonna talk about edible fungi in this presentation. And of course, any fungi that you're gonna forage from the wild, you should have training in how to do so first. Um, the Minnesota Mycological Society offers mushroom foray uh, adventures where you can go along and learn from experts on how to recognize and harvest wild mushrooms. So again, uh, just go picking and eating anything. Uh, look it up. I might I might say a thing is edible, but I want you to look that thing up and read about it and learn about it and test it a little bit before you dive right in and, and eat a whole plate of anything. Okay. Um, so let's see. Let's jump into our eight layers. We're gonna look at this uh, from the bottom left. We're gonna kind of make a circle here. And so uh, the mycelial layer is, is underpinning the health of all of our food for us. Uh, we have a lot of wonderful harvest in the root layer. We're gonna jump into the ground cover layer, the herbaceous layer that comes up over the ground covers. We've got vines that grow all in and through the profile of the food forest. Of course, our wonderful shrubs, understory and overstory. So let's jump into some of our favorites in all of these wonderful layers of the food forest. Now, here we are the mycelial layer. And uh, we, can, we know some of these, I'm sure a lot of you know some of these mushrooms. Now here on the bottom left, I'm holding a giant puffball. And so is my friend Nancy up here in the middle. We've got two giant puffball mushrooms there. Uh, puffball mushrooms are excellent edible mushrooms. They're great with marinara. They're wonderful in stir fries. Um, a big mushroom like that you can be eating off of for a week. You can keep, you can keep it in the fridge and keep it healthy. Um, we can see 
Uh, on the bottom in the middle, there's two pictures of wine cap mushrooms. Wine caps are excellent mushrooms that grow on leaf litter or wood debris in the garden bed. Uh, we've got uh, on the bottom right, morels, and on the top left, a chicken of the woods. Now on the top right there, you see Jose holding a mushroom that I haven't identified. I don't know what type of mushroom that is. And of course, we did not eat that mushroom. What we did with that was we put that into a compost pile. We found that fungi in the woods. We put it into the compost pile so that the fungi can grow into the compost pile, knowing that uh, beneficial mushrooms, beneficial fungi are creating mushrooms in the forest and so we can grab those forest mushrooms put them into our compost pile and that fungi will start eating down our and breaking down our uh, organic matter in our compost piles so let's see i mentioned the wine caps grow on um, on the uh, debris the organic matter debris in the garden uh, and that's you know very easy to get wine cap spores and spread them around in the garden. There's laboratories all over the internet that are reputable that you can get the wine cap and you can get spores from all of these types of mushrooms and many more and uh, spread them into your garden. Um, you can spread the spores uh, in your uh, directly in the garden bed or into the compost pile, and we do both. Uh, some of these types of mushrooms, like the morel, are actually uh, mycorrhizal in their relationship with plants and that means that they will develop a relationship wherein the root of the plant and the hyphae of the fungi combine together they they work together the plant gives the fungi sugars from uh, that it's making through photosynthesis and uh, the fungi is gathering water and nutrients out of the environment dissolving them with the cytoplastic tips on the growth points of all the fungal hyphae out there dissolving sand, still clay, and organic matter, and shipping them back along the fungal hyphae to the plants in exchange for those sugars. Uh, morel mushrooms do that, puffball mushrooms, and chicken of the woods will all do that. These are um, what we call mycorrhizal fungi. And so they're not only uh, are they edible, but they're also beneficial for all the trees and shrubs we're trying to grow. The mycelial layer is important to talk about first because it underpins the health of the rest of the food forest. Here's what some of that mycelial layer looks like in uh, under our microscopes. We see some of these uh, fungal hyphae, these tubes of hyphae uh, of fungi that grow out of these chocolate brown bacterial aggregates in the soil. The bacteria are dissolving the sand, silt, and clay and organic matter as well. And uh, in conjunction with the fungi, they're all making this beautiful humic acid that holds on to all of the nutrients that plants need and allows plants to get those nutrients off them at any time. Now, all of these pictures are taken under my microscope. I like to take soil samples so I can see what's alive in there. When you have a healthy diversity of fungi in the soil, you start to see a lot of other creatures show up in the soil profile. These long creatures like the top right and, uh, and, the, and the bottom uh, from the left here, these are nematodes, microscopic worms. These are beneficial organisms that will uh, help protect, protect against pathogens. And very importantly, they eat bacteria all day and then they leave the waste behind and that waste is just pure plant food, it's nitrogen. Plants love it. So having nematodes all over plant roots, extremely beneficial. Same thing, microarthropods, which we see two uh, uh, photos of microarthropods here in this, in this image and those are soil mites. Uh, excellent for moving around the organic matter and uh, chopping it up and helping to uh, to break down the organic matter in our compost and our soils. And we see on the bottom left here a testate amoebae, and amoebae are uh, again a very important part of the soil profile of the uh, microbiological life in the soil. And they are, um, are are supported. All of these creatures are supported and live uh, when we have plenty of fungi in the soil. Okay, now let's jump into that root layer. Root layer is very fun. We start to find some yummy edible materials in the root layer. Top left here, we've got some sweet potato vines. I love putting sweet potato vines into my, uh, into my, um, into my gardens all over the place because they'll grow these uh, giant sweet potatoes to eat. Uh, these are actually from a decorative sweet potato vine called Marguerite. And we uh, that whole harvest came out of the northbound brew pubs uh, window boxes. We've got uh, big boxes there where we grow a bunch of sweet potatoes and other tropical plants every year. Bottom left, we see Minnesota native ramps. These are a type of onion 
that grows in the wild in the woods. And keep in mind, if you're out harvesting from either your backyard or from the woods, don't harvest everything. Don't even harvest most of it. Just take a few of anything that you find because we have to keep in mind that our plants are, um, they're ever more rare all, every day. And so we need to make sure that we're not wiping out whole, whole system of those native plants by over harvesting. Uh, bottom right hand side, we see sunchokes. That is uh, AKA Jerusalem artichoke, a uh, big, tall native sunflower, perennial sunflower that grows edible tubers. And here's my buddy Jay with some onions. And of course we know all the onions and garlics are excellent part of the uh, of the root there. In the middle here, we see the uh, roots of a legume. I think this might be actually alfalfa roots. And we can we know it's a legume because we see these little dots on the roots. And those balls on those are actually uh, little spaces where bacteria uh, group together inside the plant and they start holding nitrogen. And so when we talk about legumes or peas fixing nitrogen out of the atmosphere, they're actually grabbing the nitrogen and they're storing it inside these root nodules that uh, are filled with bacteria. And that bacteria is actually the source of nitrogen. Once that, once that bit of root dies off, then that bacteria is freely available in the soil for the other plants to absorb. Here are some more of my favorite root layer plants to start thinking about. Uh, up on the top left, we see a blend of horseradish and burdock. Horseradish being a cultivated root that we love, uh, very spicy, and then burdock uh, being a weedy root that we just started thinking about. Um, you know, they sell burdock roots and and uh, uh, some of these other plants like dandelion, they sell that at the co-op uh, at, at some of these high-end food stores. And um, so we can start thinking about them as being uh, actually excellent sources of food. The burdock itself uh, is a biennial. And so the first year that it's in the ground, it has a soft root and that root is quite yummy. Um, works really good in stir fries, uh, soups, salads. Uh, uh, second year, it gets woody and so it's not edible the second year. Uh, here, let's see, we've also got dandelion root. We've got some daylily, which has uh, every part of the dandelion and daylily is edible. I included them in the root layer here. They also belong in the herbaceous layer because every part is edible on those plants. Uh, we see sweet potato vine, marguerite down in the bottom right there, and it's uh, planted in a formal garden next to uh, some sedum and some yucca, the yucca being a native plant that actually is part of the herbaceous layer because it has an edible fruit on it. Uh, and then here in the middle, we've got nut sedge, a yellow nut sedge, uh, which has an edible tuber. Uh, so uh, start to think about some of these weeds in your garden um, as not just uh, being a, a negative, but actually uh, sometimes really quite edible. Now uh, here we go, we're jumping into the ground cover layer and we see top right here, uh, that this has a blend of uh, uh, ginger and violets and uh, Virginia water leaf. And uh, the Virginia water leaf is uh, excellent, uh, actually, and the violets, excellent leafy greens in the early spring. Um, the uh, ginger in this picture uh, is edible, but it does contain quite a bit of oxalic acid, so we don't eat a lot of Minnesota native ginger. We're just eating a little bit at a time of the roots, maybe in a tea or something like that. Uh, then on the bottom left and right, we see strawberries, excellent ground cover, and again, some of that Virginia water leaf up against a willow tree. Uh, Virginia water leaf is a, it makes a great salad. Uh, and so these are excellent ground cover plants. The, uh, the violets there on the top left, the, the leaf and the flower edible stem to uh, makes an excellent salad. Uh, and so, you know, just start to think about the ground cover layer as being a place where not only are we protecting the, the, the landscape from having weeds uh, by growing these ground covers, uh, but we're putting something edible right at the very base of the landscape and wild strawberries for my for you know for my money are are the yummiest by far um here's a few more excellent ground covers uh let's see let's go with the top right we've got some ground cover blueberry there we see those growing in northern minnesota a lot blueberries can be a little tricky because you need a fairly acidic soil uh next to it in, in red is the bunch berry that's a dog relative i was just able to find some bunch berries for sale so i'm going to be adding some of those to my food forest garden 
Um, and on my hand here, we've got three very common edibles. Of course, we talked about the dandelion on the left. The, in the middle, that is the leaves of lamb's quarters. Um, and on the right, that those are the uh, that's the foliage from wood sorrel. And wood sorrel is um, tastes like lemons. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, again, has a little oxalic acid in it, so we can't we don't want to overdo it. But, but having some of that in the salad really gives it a little zing. And the middle there on my hand, that that uh, lamb's quarters, that is like spinach, chenopodium. Um, it's uh, it also you know quinoa is a relative uh, is a type of chenopodium. And uh, it's actually really yummy. It's it's a great uh, makes a great salad, uh, kind of like a spinach, like the base of the salad. Um, you can also you know saute it, uh, and uh, it has many it has kind of some fun names. Uh, so uh, lamb's quarters, easy to remember, um, because it grows on compost piles. Farmers of old would call it dirty dick, and uh, because I'm trying to help everybody remember how edible it is we now call it delicious dick and so uh you know uh, do with that what you may it's a it's a fun plant really good grows well on compost piles and um actually has uh the ability to transform a heavily nitrogen compost pile into something that's uh, where where the nitrogen is uh denitrified through through a denitrifying bacteria so it's not as uh, it won't burn out your plants um, after you after you run some lamb's quarters through your compost pile. Uh, let's see, top left we see a pollinator on some wood sorrel. The wood sorrel has a heart-shaped leaf, and uh, it's bright green, and it has these little yellow flowers. That's how we can identify it. On the bottom left there, uh, that is wintergreen, and wintergreen is a uh, Minnesota native ground cover shrub that uh, has an edible tuber. I have not eaten it, so disclaimer, I don't know how it tastes, um, but I do hear it's edible, and I was just able to find some of this plant as well, so I'm gonna put that into my garden as well here at home. On the bottom, we've got the bee lawn with uh, a few edibles in it, uh, the white clover, the self-heal, creeping thyme, all edible, and then sheep sorrel on the bottom right. These are all excellent additions to the ground cover layer, um, and will really help, uh, help you find some exciting stuff to eat in the garden. That's where some of that kind of fun, more rare material comes in. Now here we get into the herbaceous material in the garden. So this, these are plants that will grow up out of the ground every season and die back, whether they're perennials or annuals. Uh, we see here on the left, of course, that common milkweed. And common milkweed is quite edible. It's a lot like asparagus. Again, I would really recommend getting Sam Thayer's book, uh, uh, Edible, uh, oh, why am I? Harvest, uh, it's called, I think it's called Edible Harvest from, uh, from Sam Thayer. And he has uh, uh, recipes for, for the milkweed in there. And uh, of course, milkweed is excellent for butterflies and bees. We can see the bees on this one here. Milkweed, you're gonna pick it when it's young, uh, when the stalks are just emerging out of the ground, rather like asparagus. And then uh, it can be eaten at that point raw or sauteed, uh, cooked, uh, chopped up and boiled, these kind of things. Uh, here we see columbine, which has uh, edible flower, quite yummy, uh, a little, you know, very floral in its, in its taste. Uh, we have, um, let's see, we have on the bottom center there, that's wood nettle, and uh, both stinging nettle and wood nettle are highly nutritious, very edible. They need to be blanched to remove the sting, uh, but uh, once that's done, they are very nutritious plants, excellent eating. Uh, we got garlic mustard, uh, you know, non-native, uh, much maligned plant, uh, but it can make an excellent um, uh, addition to uh, to spice up a salad. Uh, and uh, and, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a yummy plant. Now, we don't want to necessarily encourage some of these non-native plants to spread everywhere, and that's why picking them right after they've gone uh, to flower before they go to seed and harvesting them and, and using them in our in our foods can be an excellent choice. Uh, we can actually help reduce the amount of non-native plants out there. Top right here, we're, we're looking at uh, some um, ostrich fern and ostrich fern makes those fiddle heads that kind of unfurl every spring and uh, those can be sauteed, very yummy. And then on the bottom right, we've got some Minnesota native ramps. Again, leafy, 
leafy green edible there. And here are some more uh, non-native edibles that a lot of us like to utilize. Uh, uh, top left there, we've got mountain orec, and that's a, an annual that comes back from seed every year. It's really beautiful, that red, red leaf is very easy to grow. We got some, a big asparagus stalk there. Keeping in mind, asparagus loves to grow in tall grass. Uh, it grows best in ditches. And so having asparagus surrounded by tall native grasses will actually help it grow. Every part of the sunflower is edible. Um, a lot of folks don't know that hostas are edible. There's some bacon wrapped hostas. Of course, you wrap anything in bacon, it's probably gonna taste a little bit better, but uh, but those new emerging shoots from the bacon, from, from the hosta plant, are, uh, are good eats. They can be cut off and, and much like the fiddlehead or asparagus, uh, sauteed or, or boiled, uh, uh, steamed, these kind of things. Uh, we've got comfrey down on the bottom. Not all of our edible plants are, are something that uh, we're gonna be eating for a meal. Maybe some of them are medicinal like the comfrey. Uh, and then uh, comfrey is excellent soil conditioning plant. And then on the bottom left there, of course, giant rhubarb, everybody loves rhubarb. Now let's talk about the vine layer. Um, I'm going to highlight four vines uh, that are native to Minnesota and then some non-native vines here too. So well, actually three vines that are native to Minnesota. We've got grape vines on uh, left and right here. Everybody should have a grape vine in their food forest. Of course, it's just so much fun to walk under the arbor and pick grapes when they're in season. Uh, and then on the top here, we've got uh, ground uh, American hog peanut, um, Amphicarpea brack. Bra Teata, Bracteata. Uh, and this has an edible tuber. Uh, so I want you to, I've never eaten this. I want you to look this up before you try and eat it. Make sure that you know what you're looking at. Um, but I'm told that this is a staple of of Native American diet. Sam Thayer really speaks highly of it in his books. Uh, and so I know I've seen a uh, hog peanut growing in a lot of my landscapes as a weed. And uh, we're starting to instruct our landscapers to leave this in some in some settings where uh, it can provide some benefit. And then uh, down below the the peanut, the hog peanut, there we have the groundnut, and this is Apios americana, uh, and groundnut again has an edible tuber. And so uh, groundnuts are uh, groundnuts and hog nuts, I think, are excellent. Or hog peanuts are excellent additions to the food forest. Thinking about um, how the food forest has kind of spaces between the herbaceous layer and the shrub layer that could be taken up by something, um, you know. But but vines are the thing that can that can grow in those spaces and can find those unused portions of sunlight within the food forest to take advantage of. Here we've got a few more excellent. Uh, Additions for the vine layer, of course, we've got all of our curbits, uh, you know, our zucchinis and cucumbers and all of these, uh, and, and then tomatoes are excellent. Uh, I think about our vegetable vines as being kind of off towards the edge of the food forest, not necessarily in the center, but more harvestable at the edge. And then things like on the top right, we see clematis uh, growing up in some, uh, in some raspberry there. And the clematis virgins of ours is, is the native clematis that is um, prolific in its growth and blooming. It brings in massive amounts of pollinators. Excellent plant, really wonderful for providing some uh, screening or privacy on the edge of the property. And a great non-edible uh, addition to help the pollinators along in our, in our food forests. Now let's get to the shrub layer. And here in the shrub layer, we've got uh, of course, raspberries. Uh, here we've got Western sand cherry, uh, American cranberry. Uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, hazelnut here. We've got hay. All of these plants are actually, uh, except for the sand cherry, we've got all of these plants here in our backyard food forest. Uh, bottom, we've got some currants and uh, and choke choke berry, and uh, then there's an ant in there pollinating the service berry. Ants, excellent pollinators, um, and uh, you know, thinking about sometimes we don't like some of these creatures we see in the landscape. However, they all do play an important role. Um, all of these pictures, except for that sand cherry picture, all these pictures are from the backyard. Uh, so we we really, after a while, we, you know, those shrubs start to grow up and mature and become just excellent uh, members of the food forest here. Now, 
these we go into some um, a blend of non-native and native shrub for uh, to get some some additional really good yummy value out of the garden here. Bottom left, that is honeyberry. Everybody should have a honeyberry. They're so delicious. They're wonderful. They're easy to grow. They taste a lot like blueberries. Uh, but they, you don't have to acidify the soil. They grow in a regular garden soil very well. They get about six feet tall and they bloom early. The bees love them. And uh, they're, my honeyberry in the front yard is filled with berries right now. Uh, that's the honeyberry flowers uh, above the fruits there. Uh, to the right on top, uh, in the middle, to the, just to the right of the honeyberry, we see elderberry. And then moving along to the right there, there's choke, uh, excuse me, those are Nanking cherry flowers and nanking cherries uh, on the stem and in the bowl uh, there. Uh, nanking cherry is another plant. Everybody should have a nanking cherry in their yard. If you've got a sunny spot, it's about six feet tall, palms and white, very early, and uh, one of the yummiest flower uh, uh, cherries in Minnesota. Um, it's a fairly small cherry and it's stemless, so you you, you use them in, uh, you either freeze or, or cook with them right away or, or make a jam and jelly. Um, or eat them raw right away, but uh, excellent, very, very prolific. And the great thing about Nanking cherries is they come true from seed. So you can eat some cherries, save the seeds, give the seeds to your friend, and they can grow their own cherry bushes. And of course, not every plant in the food forest is edible for people. So here in the middle, we've got some dogwood. This is a red twig dogwood. I've got gray dogwood, red twig dogwood, and pagoda dogwood all growing here along with the buckberry dogwood. Uh, and, and so we've got you know four different types and only three of those are edible for people, but uh, very high wildlife value out of dogwoods. So I include them in all of my food forest designs. Now let's jump into the understory plantings. And uh, again, behind me, we've got the choke cherry representing one of my favorite understories. And uh, top left, that, that bloom there, that's the choke cherry bloom. This giant shrub in the backyard was just absolutely filled with those beautiful white flowers and bringing in tons of bumblebees. Uh, choke cherries then just to the right that's what the choke cherries look like and you want to let them get a little bit darker than they are in the picture there before you eat them they are a um, astringent because they they taste very very bitter and uh yet they're delicious and so it's a bit of an acquired taste almost almost like coffee's an acquired taste um, uh, but choke cherries are very nutritious delicious birds go crazy for them um I, I really recommend them and they make an excellent, you know, kind of a big stand. Uh, to the right there, all the way to the right here, we see what uh, we call the lover tree. We took two young mulberry trees in our yard uh, when they were babies and we just twisted them around each other. And, you know, so sometimes the weeds come in and you can be creative with them and you can have some fun with them. You can let them grow up. And, and then of course these mulberries feed us and the birds. Uh, everybody loves eating out of the mulberry trees. Um, we've got plums here in the picture and uh, some viburnum. Uh, lots of excellent choices for our understory layer here in the, in the food forest. Um, and these, these plants start to give that, the food forest a little bit of bulk. They start to grow. We get that understory layer. We're getting 20, 25 feet up into the air with some of these, you know, between about 10 and 25 feet. And that's, that's really providing a lot of habitat. You think about all of the blooms, the thousands of blooms on the choke cherry that are available then for the pollinators and the thousands of, of uh, cherries that are available for the birds. These are excellent plants to have in our landscape. They really help feed wildlife. Mulberries, choke cherries, birds will plant them as well. Um, here are a few more pictures of uh, understory trees. Of course, our apples and pears get to count in this layer and, and plums and cherries of all sorts. Uh, and then sometimes we have some non-edible plants in this layer as well. So you see the red bud there in the bottom left. Uh, I, I just, I'm a big sucker for red buds. They're so beautiful. I'll include them in all of the food forest designs and of course all of these other plants uh, just create these wonderful moments every now and then in our in our landscapes okay and now we're getting into the tall stuff and so overstory trees we want to start to think about how we can incorporate um, the overstory because these are again the biggest plants that we're going to be putting into the environment they're going to produce massive amounts of proteins available for wildlife. Um, and so, you know, oak trees uh, and, and uh, black walnuts, uh, massive uh, hick hickory trees, uh, 
uh, uh, maple trees, massive amounts of proteins coming from the seeds on these trees. Uh, excellent trees for growing birds and uh, wildlife. Uh, black locusts, uh, excellent for the pollinators and for wildlife. Uh, basswood trees in the bottom left there. Basswood has an edible leaf, uh, edible, uh, especially in the early season, delicious. It's like a, a giant salad bowl in a tree. Uh, so we can start to think about the overstory as being a place that, yeah, we might get a little bit of food here and there, you know, for tapping the maple, sugar maples, or for pulling down some of the uh, leaves from, from the basswood, um, or even maybe taking some black walnuts or some butternuts. Uh, but again, a lot of these proteins are going to be here for the wildlife. And uh, this is where we start to put in this layer of that, that we can start to build in the food, the, excuse me, the love forest layer as well, where we're bringing in some baby white pine trees like this one, excuse me, like this one here, pictured from the front yard on the right there. Uh, and we allow some of these little baby saplings to come in and grow up. And uh, one day, yes, they will dominate and take over the land here, but that's good because one day I won't be harvesting all the time from this land. So I would love it that, that, that the wildlife is still able to harvest when I'm not. Uh, top left, we see the butternut here. That's a relative of the black walnut. Again, lots of protein. And, and these nut and seed producing trees are going to produce a massive amount of protein for our, our, our ecosystems, which uh, is, is irreplaceable. It's absolutely critical to have those proteins being produced uh, from plants in order to feed the wildlife. Now let's talk briefly about maintenance. We've gone through a lot of uh, big plant list here and we're kind of, we're getting a little bit over time. So let's jump into maintenance and then we just got a few more slide to get into. Uh, food forest maintenance is actually quite simple. It is the lowest maintenance form of landscape that you're gonna be able to, to install in, in, in a residential space. Um, essentially, we wanna make sure that we're keeping the soil covered. So whether the short term covering with mulch or a long term covering with ground cover or other plants, the soil needs to be covered at all times. We want to remove and replace when it comes to dying plants, sick plants, non-native plants, invasive plants. We want to remove them, but then we want to replace them. Never just make a void. Don't go in and remove all the buckthorn and not put anything back. When you remove the buckthorn, make sure you're putting something in that will replace that canopy layer. So maybe service berry or viburnum or dogwood to replace the buckthorn. Um, removing and replacing. If you got a big ash tree that's got the emerald ash, don't inject it, with, don't have it injected with neonicotinoids or emamectin benzoate. That will go through every part of the plant and uh, poison all of the insects that go to it. Instead, once it gets the emerald ash borer, remove the, the ash tree and replace it with another native tree like a hackberry or, or an oak or perhaps willow like you see pictured here. Uh, or a poplar, quaking aspen. These types of trees will feed massive amounts of, of wildlife, uh, very important uh, critical wildlife habitat. And we can have it right in our own backyard. Removing and replacing, then uh, weed and seed. Now this is kind of following the remove and replace. Whenever we're gonna pull out a weed, we'll put in some seeds. So we're gonna, we don't like that burdock or that dandelion there, fine, pull it off, but put in some seeds for some bee lawn or put in a planting of, of uh, some salt seal or some ferns or something that you like to go in, some native plant that you like to go in and replace. So don't just remove, but replace, and don't just weed, but also seed. And then uh, finally, when you find something you don't like uh, in the garden, chop it up, drop it on the ground, use it as living, as a type of mulch. Allow the, the, um, allow the roots to stay in the ground from the the woodies that you're that you're chopping down. If you get a bunch of baby elms or green ash like we do in our garden, we just go around and we cut down the tops, allow that to become part of the mulch on the ground, and then uh, keep those roots in the ground because that's just going to add sugar into the ground and feed more fungi. It's not a problem to have those roots in. We just keep in mind that we don't want to let the weeds get higher in the garden. That's the general rule. Don't let the weeds get higher in the garden. Once you're following that rule, um, you know you can just go around and chop down. Uh, stuff that you don't want where you don't want it and allow it to, to stay there on the ground uh, and, and perform as mulch. Now, everything we're talking about here, of course, it's a lot of hard work. The installation of, of gardens and a food forest can be quite a lot of hard work. Um, 
And uh, of course, the hard work comes in removing the invasive species. The number one invasive species we have to remove in our landscapes is Kentucky bluegrass. It's covering more land than any other type of crop in the United States. And it is doing more ecological damage than any other plant. So the more that we remove of the Kentucky bluegrass, the better we get. Um, and it's time for us to start thinking about how, you know, we think about our landscapes as being a product, uh, you know, the damage in our landscapes as being a product of colonialism uh, and the consequences, uh, the worst consequences of colonialism are not you know, buckthorn and garlic mustard. They, they are corn, soy, lawn, and pave where we have destroyed the ecosystem where things can't live anymore. And these are invadable landscapes that we're creating. Um, choices to make the the corn soy lawn and pavement landscapes these are choices that are deeply tied to our culture these landscapes are are the expression of our culture itself we like to focus on the buckthorn and the garlic mustard because we don't really have to change ourselves to pull those out but if we focus instead on corn soy lawn and pavement we're going to find that we're going to have to change our own lifestyles a little bit in order to accommodate a healthy planet for all the earthlings and so it's going to take some hard work, and that work is going to be on the installation end, it's going to be on the harvest end, but it's not going to be the work of maintenance. And um, and, and and so we, um, we need to keep in mind that uh, that while we've learned to find a semblance of health in some of these landscapes, like the corn and the soy and the and the lawn and the pavement, um, we're alone uh, as Earthlings in being able to adopt these landscapes to fit our lifestyles. We need a higher vision. We need a vision that grows health for the wildlife and for people at the same time. And of course, when we do grow the food forests, we're, we're sharing, we're creating a space for a menagerie. Uh, the rewards of food foresting are not just ours alone. Um, you know, we're not the only earthlings and, and it's kind of a lonely existence here if you think about it, out here on this planet floating around in the middle of outer space. And, and we have these big, you know, sci-fi dreams of traveling to Mars and the, and the big super rich guys are going to take us to Mars in 10 years or 20 years. And, and yet, you know, yay Mars and yay the moon. There's, there's nobody on Mars. There's no frogs or bees or butterflies or birds on the moon. Uh, we have the earth. And, and we are here to share the earth and make sure that we don't destroy it in our attempt to live on it. Um, so while the top scientists in the world uh, basically have deemed it utterly impossible for us to find anywhere to live beyond this planet, we keep on aiming our thoughts there. We need to start aiming our thoughts here at home in how to grow health. Um, you know, the only reason to go to outer space is really to benefit, you know, some rich guys. And, and what we need to do is, is benefit all of our families and all of our communities and the ecology of this planet. Um, uh, so that's all to say, focusing on the backyard food forest is a much better use of energy than uh, trying to get rich and, and, uh, and fulfill some kind of uh, sci-fi dream. And uh, of course, here are some more of those creatures now. Now, we don't necessarily always love all the creatures, uh, you know, or enjoy seeing them. Sometimes we get scared by snakes. And there's a cute little bowl that I picked up uh, at the park, baby squirrel crawling up my leg, a uh, rabbit in the garden. Um, sometimes we don't like seeing these animals, but we got to remember that uh, they're important. They're very important. They're food for all the other animals, the predators and, and the, the amazing creatures that we share this planet with. And so if we do a little bit of work, to grow a food forest at home, then um, what we're going to do is we're going to be creating a space that can grow life for all of the earthlings that we love to share this planet with. So let's see. Now that brings us to the end of our food forest discussion here tonight. Hi, um, we have a few questions. Do you mind if we touch on these questions quick and then do the tour? I think they'll be pretty that easy. That sounds good. Is that okay with you, Emma? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I'll get offline, Emma, and you can take that away. Awesome. Um, so Yvette had a question. If I wanted to start a compost pile with leaves, can I just add the red wiggler worms to the pile? Well, again, a compost pile needs to be at about 50% moisture. And as long as you have that moisture content, 
then yeah, it could be just leaves. It could be leaves plus kitchen waste. Um, the, you know, a lot of uh, compost information that you find out there is about um, having a ratio of brown to green uh, in your pile. And um, actually when, when you push through the, the best of the best information out there, what you find out is that regardless of your ratio of brown or green, if you have 50% moisture in your pile, then in the end, you're gonna get highly fungal compost. And that's what we're aiming for, since mo really the main thing that we're missing in our soils is the fungal component. So uh, I'm not sure, I hope that answers the question, uh, but essentially, yes, you can add red wiggler worms in, as long as you're putting them in the dry pile, you wanna make sure you're about 50% moisture. Great, thank you. Next question is from Lauren on what is your opinion on clover lawns? I love them. So a clover lawn uh, feeds over 60 different species of native bees according to a study from the U of M around bee lawns. And uh, we get our bee lawn seed mix from Twin City Seed. Bee lawn seed mix, there's two different types. One has white clover, which again feeds more bees than any other single plant that I know of. Uh, and uh, even though it's a non-native plant, Think of it like uh, like a white guy like me eating pineapple. Like my, my ancestors never grew up eating pineapple, but I can eat pineapple and get a lot of nutrition from it. Just like Minnesota native bees can eat non-native white clover and get a ton of nutrition from it, very good for them. Um, so white clover is an excellent uh, no-mo alternative for a lawn. Uh, I love it. We use it with uh, creeping thyme, fescue grass, and uh, self heal as a part of a bee lawn seed mix. Awesome. Um, how often can you overseed and use compost extract on the lawn? Often as you want. Uh, you can you can use your compost extract. Uh, basically, you don't want to go more than every two weeks spraying a compost extract, a liquid compost extract on the lawn. Um, we didn't talk about liquid compost extract here in this presentation, but I do have a uh, blog post about worm bins that goes into making a liquid compost extract. Uh, but if you treat every couple of weeks in a space um, with the extract, then uh, you, won't, you aren't gonna be overdoing it. Uh, seeding, you're gonna wanna, as a homeowner, um, take advantage of the rain when it's about to rain and uh, bring a little bit of the bare areas in your lawn and seed at that time before rain and let the rain help you. Um, aerating and overseeding can be done, we do it three times per season, uh, along with, we also do liquid compost extract treatments for our client three times per season. Um, we do one in the spring, one in the late summer, and one in the early fall, because we know that the early spring and the late fall are the most active times in the soil microbiology. So that's what, what we're trying to influence and help the fungi grow at those times. Gotcha. Great. Caroline writes, I'm in the very beginning stages of establishing a food forest on a slope with tall grass. How do I want to clear the grass to make room for plants? Well, it all depends. Um, you either, uh, first of all, we never want to bite off more than we can chew. So uh, in terms of clearing, uh, if you're going to clear grass, then only clear as much as, as you've purchased plants uh, or that the budget allows for plants to go in to replace the grass. We don't want to end up with large voids in the landscape uh, where we've cleared something and we don't have something to replace right away because that's going to become very high maintenance right away with a lot of weeds coming in. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, does, does, does that get to the answer to that question? Yeah, it's about removing and replacing grass. So there may be ways to close it. Uh, yeah, so, so removing and replacing grass, yeah, you might want to phase that in and, uh, and come in um, or maybe just remove as much as you have budget to, to fill in with plants at a time. Whenever we remove grass, we're adding compost to the space and turning that compost in with shovels in order to break up the compaction layer and add in some uh, organic matter underneath the soil so that we're feeding fungi and bacteria. Um, on a hillside, it's very important not to remove more than, you know, not to bite off more than you can chew at any one time so that you're not removing more lawn than you actually have uh, the ability to replace. And sometimes in a tall grass environment, what I'll do is I'll just pull out a little chunk and pop one plant in right there. Just let the grass be tall around that area, um, keeping the grass as a ground cover, uh, but, but allow, you know, pulling it back enough to allow whatever plant I just put in to come up. Mm. 
Um, Grace asks, any places you recommend sourcing edible shrubs for the understory layer? Yes. Um, so my favorite nurseries to shop at are uh, exclusively native nurseries, and, and that's going to be Outback Nursery in Hastings, Landscape Alternatives in Schaefer, Prairie Restoration uh, also in Schaefer, and, um, and then here locally, we'll utilize uh, Mother Earth Gardens and South Cedar and Bachman's um, Gertens. You know, we'll go to all the nurseries around to find the selections we need. Uh, and sometimes we have to turn to the internet to find some selections that aren't always readily available, like Honeyberry or Nanking Cherry, which are excellent, but not always easy to find. Mm, good to know. Um, is Lily of the Valley invasive, and what is a good replacement? It is not invasive, no. It's a native plant. It's supposed to be here. It feeds bees. Um, it's an excellent ground cover plant. Um, I love it at the base of, uh, under, so as a kind of a, a ground cover layer underneath ferns and sedges, uh, service berry shrubs. Um, I, I love, we have a big section of Lily of the Valley here, and we've got uh, ferns and mayapple coming up through it, um, uh, comfrey, uh, all kinds of stuff pushing up through it. So I, I love Lily of the Valley. I encourage folks to grow it. Um, it's non it's non invasive. It's a low maintenance ground cover, and uh, wherever you have it, you might want to try and find the value in it, so that um, you don't end up pulling out something that's actually you know really beneficial to you and the bees. Great, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I think it might be a good time to switch gears to the tour. If any other folks have more okay. questions, you're welcome to email Lara. Um, but I think. Does that work for you, Russ? In Chesney? Absolutely, yes. So Great. let's see here. Hand me, hand me this real quick. Yeah, do I need to go yeah. to that? Yeah, you can mute on there. I can help. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So let's take are we are we ready there, Emma? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. All right. So we're gonna do this uh, selfie style. I'm gonna walk around and we'll take some video selfies with the plants. So again here, we've got choke cherry, and uh, let's have a look here if we can get some of these, can we see these cherries, uh, young green cherries starting to grow there. There we go. And the tree is just absolutely filled with it. Let's try and get a sense of how big this tree is. Uh, it's a stand of trees, a grove of choke cherries. And again, this was the first shrub that we put into the landscape here and it's just gotten enormous over time. Let's see, oh, there's Chesney, and uh, and she's actually growing our twin boys right now. She's got Patrick and William inside, and they're, uh, they're gonna be coming out here in July, anytime. Pretty exciting. So let's keep on looking around the food forest garden here. Um, here, let's see, there's a comfrey plant, uh, absolutely beloved by uh, the bumblebees once it starts blooming, and we can see on the top of it here, perhaps, there's some blooms about to start coming in. Uh, behind the comfrey there, we've got all kinds of ferns and uh, some touch-me-nots, Minnesota native impatiens. We've got uh, on the ground here, a baby white pine and a yew shrub, and then all sorts of uh, wonderful little Minnesota natives. Um, we can get down here and I'll show you. There's some lily of the valley down there. Uh, I just love it, it grows really well. We got some new may apples here. Um, those are gonna get uh, big and juicy and excellent. And then let's see, now, okay, let's go over here. And uh, now I can see a few more cherries. We've got, uh, a few different types of cherry in here, some um, sand cherry and choke cherry. We've got, uh, I think, some that have hybridized over time. And then uh, that's uh, right here. This is a North Star cherry behind me now. Um, now let's move along this way. And we can see as we go down the path here, um, here are some sun chokes on the ground here next to the compost pile. 
We've got, uh, those are Minnesota native sunflowers that have uh, edible tuber roots, Jerusalem artichoke uh, is what we call it. And then they are planted here next to the big apple tree. And so here, this is a Honeycrisp apple. Um, and uh, if we get up close, we can see some baby apples coming in there. And uh, it's gonna be a banner year for the, for the Honeycrisp apple tree. And uh, then as we come around here, we see our fence. And here in the corner, we've got uh, a uh, uh, kind of a trellis there. And uh, growing up next to it is a serviceberry tree. And uh, the serviceberry, also called Juneberry, is going to bloom or already bloomed and is going to produce fruits here. Uh, it's got young fruits on it that will be coming in really soon. Uh, then we've got a baby a uh, brand new baby mountain ash tree. Mountain ash, uh, different than the ash that gets the emerald ash borer and uh, an excellent Minnesota native understory tree that has berries on it, but non-edible. And then of course, uh, here on the uh, trellis, we see some Minnesota native clematis, virgin's bower growing up there to block our uh, beautiful view of the, the garbage cans there. As we come along here, we can see that we've just put in. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad it's back. Well, I was just saying that uh, um, we have uh, we always want to include some sunny plants in a shady arrangement and some shady plants in a sunny arrangement, so that as the changing as the light changes in our gardens, we have plants there that are resilient that can adapt to those changing light conditions. Let's see. Now let's take a walk up towards the front of the garden. Uh, the front of the house. Um, oh, here, let's take a quick look. There's a big old hosta coming in here. Um, and when that hosta has uh, its new shoots every season, every spring, we can uh, take a few of those off and saute them up. Really yummy. Um, we've got a couple honey berries. Oh, there's some, let's look at the pears and grapes over here. So again, this is in the backyard. And uh, here we have... Uh, a pear tree behind me and a grape trellis right up above that. And then here's a pagoda dogwood with a, uh, uh, a pear, another pear tree and some clematis vines in the background. And then behind that, uh, we've got a, a cedar that will get big and tall one day. And right behind the cedar, there's a, a viburnum. Uh, so multiple layers of canopy built in here. We can see as we look up that there's a, an elm tree over there and there's a willow tree up above us here. Um, and then let's go out towards the front here and uh, see if we can't find a little snack. It's been a nice long presentation and I could use a honey berry. So let's see here. As we're walking up towards the front, we're coming up underneath the canopy of the uh, the mulberry trees that we long time ago twisted into their um, into this what we call the lover shape there the trees hugging one and uh, then we have woodland sunflower up front here and the woodland sunflower blooms every August and brings in the monarch butterflies and the flower as well. Uh, and then let's see, let's go over here now. Uh, honeyberries are amazing. so here it's time, and so I just got a little bit for a blueberry, uh, but they are delicious. Um, they're actually a member of the uh, honeysuckle family, so they're a type of Lonicera. Uh, uh, we got Got another honeyberry over here next to the porch down there in the ground, and uh, all kinds of other shrubs and, and perennials mixed in with it. We got the next corner over here, we can start to see that on this side of the house, we've got hazelnut and gray dogwood, all kinds of big shrubs that kind of take up the entire side of the house. Uh, so let's see. Now here's my favorite part of the garden. Here's Chesney with the babies. 
And uh, so we like to come out here and uh, spend some time with the birds and butterflies. The food forest has taken us, you know, we've been working on it for 15 years, but it's a labor of love. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, and it's, it's really, it doesn't, does it feel like a lot of work to have this landscape? Effortless. Effortless. Well, there you go. So low maintenance, high, high wildlife value, high reward. That's the food forest for you.